Hello everyone at home, welcome back to another Wednesday evening at Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, we have a treat for you today, after our speaker, the skies are clear, so we're going to be switching over to the Cambridge Astronomical Association, who are going to show us what we can see in the night sky. But before that, uh, I'm here with our speaker, we've got PhD student Andy Buchan, who's going to be telling us all about how we dissect exoplanets with dead stars. It's very fascinating stuff, so over to you Andy. Cool, uh, thank you Matt. Uh, so yes, uh, my name's Andy, uh, I'm a third year PhD student, and uh, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, dissecting exoplanets using dead stars. So uh, exoplanets are planets orbiting stars other than the sun, uh, and dead stars are these objects uh, called white dwarfs, which uh, I'll describe a bit more uh, later on. Um, so just to kind of set out the uh, outline of the, of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can detect exoplanets and some of the difficulties that we run into when we try and use those measurements to determine what planets are made of. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about uh, these dead stars, white dwarfs, uh, what they are, how they can help us to resolve our, our problems. Um, and then I'll also talk a bit about what these objects seem to be, seem to be made of. Um, and there'll be a, a few little tangents along the way, which I hope you'll enjoy. So uh, to kick off, we currently know of roughly 5,000 exoplanets. Um, the exact number, which I checked earlier today, is uh, 4,913, so uh, nearly there. Uh, so these are, we know of 5,000 planets which are orbiting stars other than the sun, and perhaps I'm a bit biased on this, uh, but I think one of the most fascinating questions that really captures our imagination is uh, what are these planets like and uh, what would it be like to visit them? Um, it, are they kind of like Earth or a little bit different or completely different? Um, you can see uh, from this illustration I've, uh, that I've got here that uh, this, this is kind of showing the variety of planets um, that we have detected. And but beyond that, I mean, TV shows and video games have also come up with all kinds of weird and wonderful ideas of what planets might be out there. So uh, in Doctor Who, there's this uh, planet made entirely of diamond. Uh, then in Mass Effect 3, there's this planet made of a fictional element zero, which gives people psychic powers. Uh, my favorite is uh, this one from Super Mario Galaxy, which is made of cake. Uh, and these are all, they seem a little bit uh, fantastical, perhaps. Um, or, or are they? I mean, uh, it wasn't long ago that um, uh, researchers suggested that th this particular planet might be made of diamond. Um, I don't think the situation is quite so clear cut now, but um, it certainly raises the possibility that some planets out there might have uh, really bizarre compositions, nothing like uh, Earth. So, how do we know? How can we find out what exoplanets are, are made of? Uh, well, it's very difficult, as you can imagine. It's hard to even detect exoplanets. So unlike planets within the solar system, uh, we can't see exoplanets directly uh, or very rarely. Um, instead, we typically detect them by looking at their stars. Uh, sometimes we see stars get fainter uh, when a planet passes in front of them. So that's what this uh, animation is showing here. And we, if we observe this, we can uh, measure how much fainter the star seems to get. And that tells us uh, how large the planet is. Uh, another way we can detect exoplanets is uh, sometimes we can tell that the star is wobbling around uh, due to planets pulling on them gravitationally and we see the star kind of moving backwards and forwards uh, in our line of sight. If we observe a star using this, we can work out how, uh, how massive the planet is, how large it is. If we're very lucky and we're able to do both of those two things uh, and combine the measurements, we can work out how large a planet is uh, and how much it weighs. And when you know both of these things, it starts to give you uh, some ideas of the, the materials it might be made of. So if it's small, but really heavy, 
uh, that probably means it's made of something very dense like iron. So that might be uh, analogous to mercury in our solar system. But then at the other end of this spectrum, if, uh, if the planet seems to be uh, large but very light for its size, then we might be looking at a, a gas giant, uh, something more along the lines of Jupiter. But then the problem is that most of the time you're somewhere in between these two extremes and that makes things way more difficult. Um, if you have a medium sized, medium weight planet, um, then there's, there's lots of options. Perhaps you have a planet that's made entirely of a medium density material like water, uh, or maybe you're looking at something that has a really dense core of iron surrounded by uh, a large atmosphere. These two cases could look the same if all you know is the size and the weight of your planet. Uh, what we really need is a way to tell these options apart, especially because it could be even more complicated than this. I mean, consider that the Earth has uh, a metallic core, then a rocky mantle, then a bit of water and a bit of atmosphere. So what we really need is a way to kind of somehow cut the planet open and take a peek inside. So this is where white dwarfs can help us. Uh, but to explain how, uh, we need to firstly ask the question, uh, what is a white dwarf? So uh, a white dwarf is a dead star. Um, now, when stars die, they can become a variety of uh, weird and wonderful objects, as shown by this uh, perhaps overly complicated diagram. Um, the very largest stars uh, will go down this top path here and become something like a black hole or a neutron star. Um, that's not what we're talking about today, though. We're looking at the vast majority of stars, which, uh, like our sun, for example, which go down this uh, path uh, near the bottom, uh, becoming a, a white dwarf. Um, so what actually happens when a star like the sun becomes a white dwarf? Uh, well, it's very dramatic. Uh, the, the star runs out of fuel, which triggers a whole load of uh, uh, knock-on effects. So perhaps the most dramatic one is that the star dramatically increases uh, in size uh, and it expels its outer layers, which then become these really beautiful uh, uh, objects called planetary nebulae. So here's two of them. There's the uh, Helix Nebula and the Cat's Eye, uh, Cat's Eye Nebula. And at the center of these nebulae is just a uh, small, uh, tiny, really hot core, which is the white dwarf. Um, I don't know if you can see that red dot on the screen. That's uh, I'm not quite sure why that's there. That's that's not me. Just uh, ignore that. <laughs> um, so the it's the core, the, the tiny core in the center that is the white dwarf that's, that gets left behind when a star dies. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, um, here's a, an average star like the sun. And uh, zooming in, this little ping pong ball looking object here is uh, that's a white dwarf. And you can see it's way, way smaller than, uh, than a normal star. But it's, uh, it's in fact, um, well, it's in fact, it's, it's much closer in size to the Earth uh, as being shown here. But then the, the really crazy thing is that despite being about the size of Earth, it's actually got about the same mass as the sun. So you can imagine these are extremely dense objects. Uh, they're also very hot, as I mentioned, but uh, since they've got no fuel left to burn, all they do is they just uh, sit there, uh, getting colder and colder over billions of years. Um, eventually, something uh, they, they become uh, an object called a, a black dwarf. Uh, but that process takes so long that the universe actually isn't old enough for any black dwarfs to exist yet. Uh, so I want to show you a picture of a white dwarf. Um, so this is, this is a picture of a white dwarf. Uh, this is Sirius, uh, also known as the dog star. Uh, it's one of the closest stars to us. It's uh, 8.6 light years away. Uh, but there's a catch because it's actually two stars orbiting each other. There's Sirius A, which is a, a normal or main sequence star, to use the terminology, like our, like our sun, uh, but a little bit bigger. Uh, and then there's Sirius B, which is a white dwarf. And I've played a bit of a trick on you with this picture because uh, the white dwarf in this picture is actually here. Uh, 
that's how I, I've chosen this picture to kind of illustrate how small, look how small and how faint it is compared to a normal main sequence star. Uh, so you can imagine they're quite difficult to, to actually see. Um, now, if you were to stand on a white dwarf uh, on the surface, there would be a lot of very rapid, uh, very negative developments in your personal life. Uh, one of which is that you would be uh, crushed by the intense gravity. So you can imagine that an object this small uh, and this heavy has really, really strong gravity at its surface. Uh, it's something like 100,000 times stronger than Earth's gravity. Uh, this has some very interesting consequences for the white dwarf. Um, it has an atmosphere which is very thin and also very pure. Uh, it's made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. Um, anything heavier than hydrogen or helium, uh, which is essentially any other element, sinks straight through the atmosphere, uh, kind of like dropping a stone into a pond. Uh, when I was looking for pictures of a stone in a pond earlier, the, uh, well, the, this is the best one I found. It's not actually a stone, it's a Bluetooth loudspeaker. So just uh, pretend that that's a stone. Uh, but you can imagine the, the confusion uh, that ensued when multiple white dwarfs were detected to have uh, heavy elements in their atmosphere, elements like calcium or magnesium that, that shouldn't be there. They should just sink straight through. Um, it's kind of like taking uh, an underwater photo in, in a pond and seeing a stone not on the floor of the pond, but kind of halfway down. That's kind of what it's like if you see these heavy elements halfway down. Like if you see heavy elements in a white dwarf atmosphere, and they haven't yet sunk out of sight. Um, so the implication, if you see a stone kind of halfway down a pond, is that you're seeing it as it's sinking, like it's it's just entered the pond and, it, and you're seeing it as it's falling through. And it's a similar story with white dwarfs. So the, the discovery of these heavy elements polluting the atmospheres of white dwarfs suggests that material is in the process now of falling onto white dwarfs from outside, uh, which is really cool. Uh, there is a bit of a difference though, uh, because we can't actually uh, sort of see the material sinking in the same way that we can see a stone sinking. Like we can't just zoom in and see uh, bits of material in a white dwarf atmosphere. Uh, instead, the way we know it's there is because uh, it absorbs very specific colors of light. Uh, so you might have done an experiment like this in school where you uh, uh, called a flame test, where you burn certain chemicals, you put them in a flame uh, and it turns the flame a certain color depending on what chemical you are burning. So here's, this is me having uh, a fun day putting various chemicals inside uh, a flame. And you can, you can identify the material by the color that it, that it burns. And we do something very similar for white dwarfs. It's uh, a little bit different, but it's a similar idea. Um, by looking at white dwarfs, we can use this kind of phenomenon to work out what material is in uh, the white dwarf atmospheres. Uh, that's, that's a slight tangent, but the, uh, the point is that white dwarfs are polluted with material uh, that seems to be coming from some external source. So where is this material coming from? Uh, one idea was that the, the pollution, this, uh, this external material, uh, is caused by just the white dwarfs moving through space and kind of sweeping up the interstellar material uh, that's just lying nearby in space. Um, this idea was uh, eventually kind of ruled out because uh, it seems that white dwarfs that pass through these regions where you have material don't actually end up with any more pollution in the atmosphere. Um, there's also some uh, problems in the in the exact abundances which don't quite make sense. So the the current consensus is that white dwarf pollution is caused when asteroids or comets or planets, which I'm going to collectively refer to as rocky bodies. Uh, Pollution is caused when these rocky bodies get too close to a white dwarf and fall in. Uh, so let's talk a bit about how that works. So we have to imagine that these uh, rocky bodies orbited the star before it became a white dwarf. 
uh, back when it was a normal main sequence star. The star then expands, as we saw earlier, um, and uh, engulfs any objects which are too, which are unlucky enough to be too close. So uh, the rocky bodies must have been far enough away from the star to survive this. Um, how far exactly does that need to be, you might ask? Uh, well, when the sun expands in a few billion years time, uh, we think it will become large enough to engulf uh, Mercury and Venus. Earth is sort of borderline. It, it may or may not survive. Uh, we're not quite sure. There is a good chance that the world will end by getting absolutely roasted into oblivion, uh, assuming that we haven't already done that ourselves. So the, the rocky bodies need to be already about one uh, AU, that's the distance from the sun to the Earth, about one AU from the star in order to survive uh, the transition into a white dwarf. Uh, but then the kind of twist is that it then has to come back to the white dwarf um, in order to actually, uh, in order for us to see it polluting the white dwarf, it, the orbit has to change and it has to come close to the white dwarf. Um, at that point, uh, it will get ripped apart by the intense gravity and it can fall onto the uh, white dwarf's super hot atmosphere, getting completely cooked and disintegrated and allowing us to see it. Um, I hope you're suitably impressed with my uh, animation skills there. Um, so uh, the question is, how could a rocky body's orbit uh, change so dramatically uh, from being really far away from the, the white dwarf in order to survive um, to being close in for us to see it? Uh, this is still kind of an open question. Um, scientists have done computer simulations that show that if there's a large planet orbiting the white dwarf, uh, it can actually disturb the orbits of small rocky bodies uh, and scatter them in towards the white dwarf. Uh, so that might explain how you get small objects like asteroids close to the white dwarf. But is it possible for something large like a planet uh, to get close to a white dwarf? Um, maybe that's just something that can't happen, potentially. Well, at this point, um, I want to talk about something that's... Uh, a, a, it's, a, it's a really cool... Not, not exactly a tangent, because it's kind of relevant, but um, it, it's really interesting. Uh, you might remember that earlier in the talk, I described how we can detect exoplanets by looking for a drop in the star's brightness when a planet blocks it. Uh, well, you can do the same thing with white dwarfs and watch to see if the white dwarf gets dimmer. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, astronomers detected a planet using this technique, uh, which orbits a white dwarf. So the white dwarf is called WD 1856. Uh, it's about 80 light years away. Uh, and the planet is called WD 1856 B. Um, now, the planet is roughly the size of Jupiter. And remember that white dwarfs are the size of Earth. So that means that the planet is actually substantially larger than the white dwarf it orbits, uh, which is really weird, but really cool. Uh, so this, the illustration that I showed before of a, of a planet blocking out a small part of the star, you kind of need to think of it a little differently. It's not just blocking out part of this of the star's light. It's, it's so big that it's actually blocking out more than half. Uh, and in fact, the only reason that it doesn't block out the light completely is that we happen to be observing it from a slight angle. We're not seeing it completely uh, edge on. Uh, something else that's really cool about this system is that the time between the transits, which is when the planet passes in front of the white dwarf, is very quick. It happens once every 1.4 Earth days, uh, which is a really, really short gap between transits. Um, it means that the, uh, the planet passes in front of the star, uh, completes a whole orbit, uh, and is positioned ready to pass in front of the star again in about 34 hours. Uh, so in this diagram here, if I just pause it there, oh, no, that move to the next slide. Ah, okay, never mind. There we go. So uh, it completes a whole orbit in uh, about one and a half days, uh, which 
is only possible if the planet is very close to the white dwarf moving very quickly. So the researchers calculated how close it needs to be. Uh, and the answer is 0 0.02 AU. So that's 1 50th of the distance from the Earth to the sun, um, which is close enough that this diagram, by my estimate, is not actually that, it's not that far off from being to scale. Um, I think the orbit should be a little further out, but was, this is not uh, a complete misrepresentation of what's going on. So this provides some pretty compelling evidence that it is possible for planets to get very close to white dwarfs. Um, the exact mechanism by which that happens is a little unclear because uh, it, it, it seems like it must have started way further out in order to survive uh, the star expanding when it becomes a white dwarf. Uh, so it's not quite clear how it gets back in. The, uh, the authors suggested that if there's other planets further out, then maybe it could move closer to the white dwarf over the course of billions of years, um, which is plausible because the white dwarf is about 6 billion years old. Uh, but other people have suggested that perhaps the planet actually started off closer to the star, uh, not close enough to get completely destroyed when uh, it became a white dwarf, but close enough that uh, when the star expanded, it formed what's called a common envelope with the planet. Uh, and sort of dragged it inwards. Uh, there are other possibilities as well, so it's, it's not a closed case. Uh, something else that I think is really cool about uh, WD 1856b is that it prompted people to think about whether it might be possible to detect life on planets orbiting a white dwarf. Uh, so let's suppose, for example, that the Earth survives the sun becoming a white dwarf. Uh, well, white dwarfs are much fainter than the sun, so uh, the temperature on Earth would plummet and you'd have to be much closer in to the white dwarf in order to reach the habitable zone, which is where liquid water uh, might be sustainable on, on the surface. But we've, you know, we've seen that it, it's perhaps plausible that uh, planets can move closer to the white dwarf. So maybe we can imagine that over time, the Earth would gradually move closer in towards the White Dwarf, uh, getting close enough where liquid water could once again be possible, and perhaps life could evolve again in that environment. Uh, this is obviously a little speculative, but uh, researchers have suggested using the James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, launched uh, on Christmas Day, uh, to look for signs of life orbiting uh, on planets orbiting white dwarfs. Um, so uh, watch this space. Uh, so to kind of recap where we were, uh, we have reasonable grounds to think that rocky bodies, uh, which could be asteroids, planets, something like that, uh, can get close to white dwarfs and then fall on to the white dwarf itself. Uh, we, we, we know that some kind of rocky uh, material from rocky bodies is getting uh, onto the white dwarf. Um, and we're really interested to know what that material is made of, because uh, these rocky bodies, uh, whatever they are, they represent objects that formed around another star. And yes, that, that star is now dead and the, the whole system is kind of disintegrating before our eyes. Um, but it gives us an indication of what uh, exoplanets might be made of. It sort of gives us an idea of uh, it can give us an idea of what processes are occurring in other solar systems. And it gives us an idea of whether our solar system is typical or whether actually uh, there's something different about it. So to work out what these rocky bodies that are falling into white dwarfs are made of, uh, observers can measure how much of each element, such as calcium or oxygen, uh, is in the atmosphere of the white dwarf. Um, Earlier on, I said it would be great to be able to cut open a white dwarf and see what's inside. Uh, this is about as close as we can get. It's a reasonable approximation to dissecting uh, the, these, these rocky bodies. Uh, so we can compare the, we can measure the relative amounts of these elements in the white dwarfs and then compare them to objects that we know from the solar system to see how similar or how different they are. Um, it turns out that most of the rocky bodies polluting white dwarfs uh, are actually made of cake. 
Uh, no, I'm kidding. Most of most of these rocky bodies are a good match to uh, the building blocks of the solar system. Uh, so uh, we call this material chondritic. Uh, it, it roughly matches uh, the sun. So on this pie chart on the left, I've shown uh, what the sun is made of. Uh, we've got a lot of oxygen, uh, some carbon. Uh, there's a bit of iron, magnesium, and silicon, uh, as well as some other stuff. But you can see it's really heavy uh, in these in in these elements, carbon and oxygen. And we, in fact, see that most uh, most material in polluted white dwarfs is a decent match for this composition, uh, which is already quite interesting because it's a clue that the raw ingredients making up our solar system are the same ingredients that make up other solar systems. Um, however, other, other white dwarfs show something even more intriguing. So some, uh, some systems have a uh, comparative lack of oxygen and carbon. If I sort of go backwards and forwards between these two, um, there's way less oxygen and way less carbon and way more of these elements, iron, magnesium, silicon. Uh, this is a closer match to Earth. Um, so what, what happens here is that if you're trying to form a planet like Earth, uh, you're close enough to the sun that certain elements are unable to condense down and become part of the planet. Um, so carbon and oxygen, they're, they're called volatile elements. They evaporate easily. Uh, so the Earth actually has a lack of oxygen and carbon uh, because of where it formed. And you might think, well, hang on, there's, there's loads of carbon and oxygen on Earth. Like, uh, well, this might be a bit of a surprise, but compared to the sun, for example, it's actually uh, not got that much carbon in particular. And we see rocky bodies in white dwarfs that have uh, this kind of same pattern where the same elements are missing, which is really interesting because potentially it means that those systems formed under similar circumstances to the Earth. Uh, but we can go even further. Uh, so I mentioned that when, when these rocky bodies get too close to a white dwarf, they can get ripped apart by the white dwarf's gravity. Uh, so let's imagine what might happen if the Earth got ripped apart. Uh, so on the left here, this is a rough approximation of, of Earth. Uh, we've got an iron core in the middle surrounded by rock. Uh, you can imagine that if we were to rip this into, let's say, a thousand fragments, I, haven't drawn that many here, but um, if you rip it apart into, into these fragments, uh, some of them will be made of, of rock from, from Earth's mantle, and some will be uh, made of core. And you can then imagine what might happen if, for example, only the fragments made of core uh, fell into the white dwarf atmosphere. What would you see? Well, you would see a huge spike in the amount of iron in uh, the atmospheres of, of these white dwarfs because the co Earth's core is made almost entirely of iron. Um, and we do in fact have examples where uh, the uh, composition of material in white dwarfs is a decent match to uh, this iron heavy uh, composition. So it looks like a core fragment has fallen into the white dwarf. Um, and we also have the kind of counterpoint to that where uh, it seems to match Earth's mantle. And this is absolutely amazing because it tells us that the processes that led to Earth forming a distinct core and a mantle seem to also happen elsewhere in the galaxy, like they must do, otherwise we wouldn't see bits of core or bits of mantle. Um, on Earth, the metallic uh, core gives rise to our magnetic field, which helps protect us from cosmic rays and the solar wind. And that might be crucial in allowing life to exist. Uh, similarly, uh, convection in Earth's mantle helps to drive plate tectonics and volcanism, which might also be important for life. So I think there's, there's something uh, really significant here where we're able to use white dwarfs to actually deduce that these processes might well be happening uh, elsewhere in the in the galaxy and other systems. I think that kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. Um, so to summarize, uh, white dwarfs are the final stage of most stars, including the sun. They're effectively dead stars. 
some of them are polluted with uh, rocky material, and that material can help us learn what other exoplanets uh, might be made of. And the overall sort of gist, what we've seen so far, tells us that um, our, our solar system is fairly typical of what goes on in uh, other exoplanetary systems. Uh, so I think that is pretty much the end of my talk. So I will answer questions if, if there are any in the chat. Uh, wonderful, Andy. Thank you so much. That's really fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, so anyone that has a question for our speaker, there is the YouTube chat box down there. Uh, let's take the question in and I will see it gets to Andy. Uh, while everyone is busy typing, um, I was wondering if I could ask a question. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're actually working on right now. It's such a fascinating subject. Um, so what, what particular research project are you, is currently keeping you busy? Uh, well, perhaps, uh, perhaps I'll talk about the, the, the one that I sort of just wrapped up um, because it kind of continues on from uh, what I was talking about um, in this slide where, so I, I was talking about how we sometimes see that white dwarfs have uh, uh, been polluted with bits of core or bits of mantle, but the exact composition of the core and the mantle has clues about how it formed. Um, so in particular, the size of the object uh, we think has some effect on which elements are more likely to be found in the core versus the mantle. Uh, so I've been working on some code that kind of models that process um, and then works backwards from the composition of, let's say, a bit of core to uh, working backwards from that to uh, how big the object must have been in order to end up with a core composition that matches that. That's really fascinating, thanks. Um, I, I, can I ask you something? This is completely out of left field, but just said purely out of interest. I've heard theories in our own solar system that talk about uh, maybe Mercury being the core of a, a previous planet, because Mercury is basically a big iron ball, right? So I've heard some people talk about the theory that Mercury is the core of what used to be a bigger planet. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that or whether this research might be able to tell us how that might have happened or anything like that. Um, I suppose, uh, hmm, let me think about that. <laughs> Sorry, this is, I don't know, it's just it's something I randomly thought of while you were talking. <laughs> I, well, I suppose, I mean, I suppose white dwarfs kind of tell us that, um, It, it, it gives us some reason to think that uh, there is a way of going from a, uh, a body with a core and a mantle to something that is dominated by one or the other. Mm. And since Mercury seems to be dominated by core-like material, perhaps, perhaps it adds some weight to the idea that it could have started out as something a bit more like Earth, where you've got more of a balance between core and mantle, and then underwent some catastrophic collision where you've ended up with a chunk of core. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not something I've actually thought about too much, to be honest. No, sure. Uh, like, inter like I said, interesting completely, question. Completely out of left field. <laughs> um, so there's people on the chat saying, um, excellent presentation. So th thank you very much. It's such a fascinating subject. Um, so the destruction of planets is not always doom and gloom. We can uh, learn some interesting things uh, <laughs> from it. Um, I, uh, how are the skies looking, observers? Can we switch over and do a bit of stargazing? Uh, yeah, we're ready. Wonderful. Well, uh, cool. over to you in that case. So thank you very much, uh, Andy, for that fascinating talk. I'm going to hand over to cool. uh, Paul and the telescopes. Right, I'll stop sharing that, I guess. Yes, please. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I will try and share my screen. How's the weather, Paul? It's mixed. The clouds are moving around. Um, I've got the moon for you, as discussed for the first object to look at. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've clicked on share and it's saying not responding, which is glorious, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't know what we're going to be able to do with that. This is the beauty is of Is it live. coming through? Yes, yeah, coming through now. Yeah, it's just being rather slow. Beauty of live shows. Right. This gives a, a wide angle view of the... Uh, moon. And we can see 
that it's uh, just gone half uh, moon. It's uh, gibbous, as it's called. And uh, the dark areas of the dark, uh, the, these seas you can see uh, with the naked eye. And um, these are formed by huge impacts about, about four billion years ago when the, the, there was a lot of debris left over in the solar system. And it's during this heavy bombardment period that the uh, planets were clobbered, including the moon. And these uh, formed these huge impact basins. And the one we can see over on the uh, left-hand side near the Terminator up the top. Can you point to it with your arrow, Paul? Uh, I can do put it in the box for you if you want. If it, yeah, if you would, please. Do you mean uh, that one? one? Yeah, yeah. That's the 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 big circle there. That's it. Thanks. Is uh, the second largest impact basin, and it's Mare Imbrium, and it's uh, it was formed as as with the others about four billion years ago, and the object that made it could have been up to 250 kilometers across. So it it received a, quite a mighty thump. It's also known as the Sea of Showers or the Sea of Rains. And then after the impact, the, the huge basin filled with lava. And we can see there are other uh, smaller um, seas off to the uh, right. But what we'll be doing is we'll be concentrating around this sea. So Paul's now just putting the uh, crater Plato right in the in the middle of the, uh, the square, and this too has filled with lava, because when um, meteorites or asteroids impact, there's often the bottom of the crater behaves like a liquid, and the bottom rebounds. I'm sure you've all seen adverts with the slow motion images of dro something dropping in milk or paint where it splashes out and then rises up in the middle. And often it's then sets as you get this uplift. So many craters and some we'll see later, like the, the uh, quite young crater Copernicus, have mountains in the center of the crater. And this is this uh, leftover uplift when the, the floor behaved like a liquid. And then going round to the, uh, to the right, we see a mountain chain. If you could bring your square down, uh, the Apennine Mountains. If we go down a bit, that's it. You can see they're quite prominent. If you keep going, keep going. You get this. That's it. It's starting to come in now. You'll see that diagonal stripe going across the, um, the rectangle. And that's the chain of mountains marking the edge of uh, the, the uh, Mare. And uh, it's, this area has some of the highest mountains on the moon. There are only three mountains over four kilometers high, and they're all in this range. And then if you carry on, uh, we can see Copernicus over to the left and below, if you would, please, Paul. And this is uh, quite a young crater. And when we ha we'll have a look at it later in close up, and you'll see inside is a, uh, is a mountain range or central peaks. And then if we come down the terminator and the terminator is this boundary between light and dark. So this is the early morning on the moon. We'll come down to the South Pole, which is heavily cratered. Now we can see oodles of craters here, including Tycho, 
another young crater uh, that's now in the in the rectangle and even on this scale you can see the central peak and that that's uh, uh, much, much younger than Copernicus. This crater was formed during the reign of the dinosaurs. And then coming right down to the South Pole, you can see some of the crater rims are in the sunshine, uh, just the mountain peaks being illuminated above the uh, uh, dark areas where the sun hasn't quite reached. And as you watch over the hours, you can see that the the, the mountains and the other areas gradually get illuminated more. So, and right in the middle of the uh, rectangle is one of the largest craters. You can see it's uh, slightly foreshortened and has a it is oval in shape, but it has five craters of various sizes right in it. And this is called Clavius. This and, one here. Yeah, that's it. We'll have a look at that on a bigger scale. But that also formed about the same time as the impact basins. And so despite its remarkable age, it's in pretty good shape because usually craters get badly eroded in with time and more craters strike them. And often they're very difficult to see. And sometimes you see them just as a ghost crater. Uh, but this is, a, this is a, a good example of one that survived the test of time. OK, um, uh, what we'll do is we'll go to David. Are you on? David, are you on the moon? No, I'm in Halton. Well done. Thanks very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I, uh, I'm on the crab. I will go to the crab. And then I'll ask you to go to the moon later and we'll have a close up of those things yes. we had a look at. OK, if we go to the the crab. That's good. We can see that there's a little bit of uh, hazy light about. Um, we are suffering from a, a bit of high cloud, but that's quite good. We can see that that's a, a uh, that's brilliant. Uh, considering the conditions, that's pretty good. Uh, that's the remains of a supernova, and it's it's the brightest supernova remnant uh, uh, we can see. Uh, well, all the other ones are much more distant and harder to see. And uh, this one that was a big star that exploded in 1054, uh, and this was this was spotted by. Chinese, Japanese, and Arab astronomers. And they could see it in daylight for 23 days. And it remained visible in the night sky for nearly two years. And this was before the uh, time of telescopes. Telescopes wouldn't come for another uh, 600 years or so. And, but the data doesn't fit the two main types of supernova, because we can tell how long it was visible for and how bright it was, there are two main sorts of supernova. Uh, a giant star that collapses down and goes supernova, and a white dwarf that gains more material and goes over its critical mass, and that can also go supernova. But those of you who were here Last week, no, we looked at a galaxy where uh, three years ago or four years ago, there was a new type of supernova discovered. And this was called an electron capture supernova. And David showed you a galaxy where one happened. And it took a few years, but th after they studied it, they realized that this electron capture, uh, this was the first uh, definite out, uh, supernova from an electron capture type. So now we believe the Crab Nebula is now the remains of a, an electron capture supernova. And uh, 
that that answers a lot of questions. And um, when this star exploded, it was about 10 solar masses before it went bang. And when it finished, Paul uh, David's just pointing to the, the remains of the star. It's not a white dwarf, as happens with smaller stars when they go um, like the sun. When they die, they go red giant and then form a, 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 a white dwarf, as in uh, Andy's talk. But this being a much more massive star has formed a neutron star. And that was what David was pointing at. And uh, uh, this is really dense. You've got the whole mass of the sun in the size of a city, not the earth, as in a white dwarf, but the size of a city. So a teaspoonful of material will weigh about 10 million tons. What does that mean? Um, 20 reasonably sized battleships. So that will give you an idea of just how dense this neutron material is. And the, the neutron star in this particular remnant rotates at 30 times a second and is called a pulsar because the rapid spinning, the uh, star emits beams of electromagnetic radiation which cross our line of sight. And the radiation would be detected as pulses. And the first pulsar was detected uh, way back in 1967 out at Mallard Radio Observatory on the Barton Road, which is about 200 yards away from where David is now. So that's a, that's a nice link. Uh, but the Crab Nebula uh, wasn't discovered until the following year. And that was discovered by the largest radio telescope on, in the world at Arecibo in Puerto Rico. And as a footnote, that telescope collapsed just a couple of months ago. And I would strongly recommend you go onto YouTube and you put the collapse of Arecibo radio dish in the search and you'll see uh, they had two cameras on the radio telescope when it collapsed. One was a side view and one was a dr drawing, a dro drone uh, that captured the collapse. It's brilliant. And that nebula, the Crab Nebula, is about 10 light years across. So it's been expanding. It's the debris left over from the explosion that's... Uh, uh, been expanding all that time since 1054. Okay, thanks very much. I'll go to the moon now, then, Brian. Yeah, um, I'll come back to you. Okay, and, uh, we'll go over to Jonathan. Hello, Jonathan. Oh. Hi yeah. there. Okay. How's your, how's your weather? Well, You're... it's a bit, it's a bit murky, but we've managed to get the seven sisters there, the Pleiades. Brilliant. Um, so, am I sharing that okay now? Yeah, I can see it. And uh, the, the Pleiades is um, the uh, right beside the moon at the moment. So if you go out when we're finished, just beside the moon, you'll see this star cluster. And uh, this cluster has a problem for us observers. Not because it's near the moon, because, because it's so big. And even when Galileo first looked at this object uh, way back in, uh, in the early 1600s, he had the same telescope problem that his field of view is just too small for the Pleiades. We've got uh, uh, Jonathan's telescope has quite a wide field of view and is struggling to get this star cluster in. It's got most of the stars, and it's also called the Seven Sisters. And we can see the seven main stars. One of them is just slightly off the left-hand edge. Uh, 
down here somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, no, just up above the other one. You can there we are. If you get there, we are. You can just see the seven stars. There's one, then come down to two, and then three, and then there's four, and then three more up there five, six, and seven. It's known as the seven sisters, but a lot of people, even with the naked eye, can see either eight or six stars. And it's a really good test of your eyes on, on a dark sky when the moon isn't there. Some people can see 13 or 14 stars with their naked eye uh, when it, in, under dark conditions. But this is a, a very young star cluster. It's still in nappies, probably 100 million years old, which is just very young for a star cluster. And it's, they're made up of hot bright blue stars and it's about less than 450 light years away in the Orion spiral arm. The cluster contains about 1500 stars including many brown dwarfs which won't show up here because they they don't give up off much light. They're, these are objects, uh, they're about a twelfth of the sun's mass or less, and they're, they're not heavy enough for the nuclear fusion reactions to start inside their cores. So they're not really proper stars. But some of the Pleiades are rotating really rapidly. Uh, Pleione, which is the one on the left, just below the one, that's it, Pleione, is uh, rotating so quickly it, it all rotates in half a day when you consider the sun rotates in just under a month and it's uh, it's its poles are flattened and it's stretched at the equator so it's it's oval it's an oblate spheroid, spheroid and it's rotating so quickly that it's very close to its breakup velocity. Electra, uh, the one over on the right hand side, that's it, is another one rapidly rotating. But this star is giving off quite a lot of uh, X rays. And is, uh, uh, the reason for this is, again, it's a result of this rapid rotation. It's thrown off a shell of gas, which is glowing and emitting the infrared. Uh, so it, it, it's, uh, it's losing mass because it spins so fast. And then the, uh, another one, Morope, is the one at the bottom. Down, that's that one. Thank you. And there's a lot of nebulosity around this star. We can't quite see it because it's so close to the moon, uh, uh, Jonathan can't go uh, in a too deeper exposure. But we're almost getting a hint of uh, nebulosity around this star. And I, might be able to, I might be able to increase the uh, brightness a little bit and see if I can do anything with it. Okay, ta. Originally, we thought that this was gas and dust left over no, I think you're increasing the <laughs> sky fog. Yeah. Yeah. Thing, no, it? no. No. On a, on a good night, you, and with really dark skies, you'd see a, a glowing mass around this and some of the other stars. Yeah, I've certainly seen that before, but it's yeah. not tonight. And I think we can see a bit of it on the on the top star as well. Yeah, that's the one which seems to come up most often. Yeah, and uh, originally it was thought that the, this was gas and dust left over. <clears throat> from the formation of the of the cluster but it's not this this cluster is moving through space and it's just chanced upon this gas cloud which is illuminating as it whizzes past and the, the last thing is that the this cluster has recently been studied by the gaia satellites which me measures the distance of stars and has found to be elongated an elongated cluster in our to pointing in our direction towards the earth so this stubby sausage of a cluster is is aligned 
with the uh, long axis pointing directly at the Earth. And it's not a chance uh, alignment. It's because directly behind us in the constellation of Sagittarius is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And that is affecting this star cluster. So it's, the, the, it's a, a very weak gravitational force. It's, it's called the galactic tide, but it's enough to pull star clusters into uh, these stubby sausage shapes. Um, and many of these star clusters are elongated because of this galactic tide. Okay, thanks. That was that was brilliant. Thanks, think, thanks, guys. Um, and, 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 I've got M forty two now. If and, you can come over to yeah, me, before well, yeah. Well, say was just to before give you my batteries scale. run out. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. Thank you. Right, Jonathan's. Uh, well, Jonathan, well, Jonathan's finished. We'll go on to the Iran Nebula or Messier, Messier 42, or most of us. I just don't seem to be able to share the screen. All right, don't worry. Again, a, for some reason. It, it took a bit of time last time. It's taking its time, yeah. It's simply called M42. We shorten it down the Messier to M. So a lot of these objects we just call... Uh, M42 or whatnot. And Messier was okay, just... here a... it comes. Okay. Right. And as requested. Good. As we can see, just as Galileo saw when he turned his... Uh, telescope he's the first person to turn the telescope onto the iran nebula and as he pointed it to the sword of uh, orion he saw these three stars and because his optics weren't very good that's all he could make out he couldn't make out any gas or dust or anything but now if paul sharpens the image we should see that there are four stars. And this is known as the trapezium. Okay, that's uh, now not working. Right. You can see it's pretty. We can see out, we can see the fourth star at the top now. Yeah, it's in focus. We've got it. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's the fourth star on the top of the four. And that's that's uh, the trapezium, and we're starting to see some of the nebulosity. And that's, this that's an eight-second exposure. So you're looking through a lot of crud. <laughs> Dare you give it any longer? Yeah, we can give it the beans. Yeah, uh, and we can start to see the gas cloud. Uh, that the uh, trapezium is in. And this molecular cloud is, is uh, about 40 light years across. But we're looking at a little bit of it. Imagine somebody taking a bite out of an apple and we're looking into the bite. And the bite is about uh, 20, 25 light years across. And that cavity has been blown out by the brightest of the four trapezium stars, uh, the bottom one of the four. Here we are. It's starting to come up now. And we're starting to see the, uh, the shape of the Iran Nebula. We'll just let it settle down. And what, what exposure time are you giving it now? Uh, that was thirty seconds, but so we'll, wanna... we'll we'll see it we'll see it change in about uh, in a yeah. in a little while because there's a little bit of movement. But that that uh, bright star at the bottom of the trapezium has blown out this cavity, so we can see inside, and there's a, about nearly th this void contains nearly three thousand young stars, and some of them 
And these have condensed down of, out of this giant molecular cloud. And some of them are so young, they're still surrounded by protoplanetary disks uh, called proplids. And the Hubble Space Telescope has been able to photograph uh, many of these infant solar systems. So they're, they're right at the beginnings of their lives. And the, the uh, nebula get it, gets its red color from the hydrogen gas, which is being excited by the radiation from these newborn stars. On a, on a good night, ah, oh, that's better, that's brilliant. Okay, so that's 30 seconds again, but this time I increased the ISO setting. Yeah. So the camera's giving it a bit more gain. And you're now seeing really quite a lot of structure and some of the dark material there as well, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, there's a, there's a finger of material, dark material, in front of the nebula coming in from the left-hand side. Uh, so that, that, that gives you uh, the... A good idea uh, but this can be seen in binoculars but you won't see it as a red color because the, the human eye just isn't sensitive to red you'll just see it as a faint patch and even with a good pair of binoculars you'll be able to see the trapezium so that that's uh, brilliant and you can see uh, although the sky is quite light because paul's struggling with uh, high level cloud uh, we we can see it expands quite away to the almost to the edge of the frame, so that's a, a cracking image under difficult circumstances. Here comes the the final one for you. Okay, now there there we've reached the limit. And yeah, it's starting to fo show the, uh, the sky the thin cloud that I'm looking through. Yeah, is getting in the way now. So yeah, it, and yeah. Uh, just above uh, to the left and above is another small nebula known as M43. We'll have a look at that next week or whenever the skies are clear, uh, when, when there shouldn't be so much cloud about, and we can look at that in more detail. But yeah, that's a, a cracking view of the Iran Nebula. As I say, it's, uh, it's about uh, 1,500 light years away. And uh, about uh, 10 years ago, it was suggested that the trapezium was the uh, location of a rare intermediate black hole. This is a, a larger than a, a stellar black hole, but much, much smaller than a supermassive black hole found at the center of most galaxies. It's probably about uh, 150 solar masses, this black hole. And it's been detected by rapid motions of stars around it. But there's a problem. Because the stellar wind from those bright stars has blown all the gas away, it means that nothing is falling onto the black hole. And so it's got nothing to feed on. And that, that makes it very difficult to detect. Only when such stuff falls into a black hole, it gives off x-rays and things, and that makes it easier to detect. So a feeding black hole is, is very easy to detect. Okay, thanks very much. And now we'll go to... Uh, David. David, yeah. David. Did, oh, br Brian, if it's any of any interest, I've actually got the a moon, and you can see it relative to the size of the Pleiades. If you want to very quickly look at that before you go to David. Yeah, okay. Well, no, no, well no, David's there anyway. It's okay. We'll leave it alone. We'll come yeah. back to you if you that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, go. Right. That's uh, that's the moon, and it's in this image. It's upside down. Can you flip it over? Are you on mute? Uh, David, you're on mute. That's it. Right way up. That's good. And there at the top of the screen, oh, we lost him. There at the top of the screen, we can see the crater Plato. 
And then just coming down and to the right, we see the Apennine Valley. Can you point that out, David? There we are. There's a gash in the moon. And it, it's, you know, just increase it so we can see it. Again, we've got some high level cloud, but I hope you can see there's a, a great big valley there called the Apennine Valley. And it's where two faults nearly over 150 kilometers uh, long, these parallel faults have caused the land between them to subside and then fill with lava. So that's, uh, that's the Apennine Valley. And then coming down towards the bottom here, there we go. We've got the range of mountains known as the Apennine Mountains. And we've got some craters to the left of them. Uh, that big one, another filled crater filled with lava is um, Archimedes. And that was uh, near there was where the first object to hit the moon. Uh, it was the Russian Luna 2 that uh, hit just near the uh, uh, Archimedes. Uh, Luna 1 missed the moon. But Luna 2, 2 came down between Archimedes and the small crater on the right, which is uh, Autolycus. So in between those two is where the first object there, yeah, that's it, where the first object to hit the moon. And then where the arrow is now, whoops, could you move it back? That dark patch coming down, if you go up a bit, go up a bit, go up keep going up to a little dark patch. That dark patch there is known as the Marsh of Rot. These, they had wonderful names for the moon early on. And where your arrow is now, you're very close to one of the tallest mountains on the moon, the second tallest mountain. If you go now up a bit and to the right, that, that's it. That's the uh, Mount Hadley. And just to the left of Mount Hadley, is where Apollo 15 landed. And this um, mountain is the second highest mountain at four and a half kilometers. Now, if we come down the row of mountains going to the left there, stop, go back, go back, keep going, keep going. Now that ridge there, that's Mount Bradley. That's uh, just uh, 4.2 kilometers high. And then carry on to the left a bit more. That oh, back a bit, back a bit, back a bit. Keep going back, keep going back, keep going, keep going. That's it, that's it. That that mountain there is Mount Huygens, and that's by far the tallest mountain on the moon. And that's uh, uh, five and a half kilometers high. And this is, don't forget, this is the edge of the impact basin of the Sea of Showers. And then as we carry on, we can see a crater here and we can see a mountain in it. Now, if you go to the left, we should be able to come across the young crater Copernicus. There we go. That's uh, uh, 80 kilometers plus. And again, we can see the mountains in the middle. You can see the central peaks. And this is, uh, uh, this is a, a good uh, object to look at with binoculars. It stands out very well. And it's comparatively young. And it's believed to have formed from a fragment of an asteroid called Eulalia, which was considerably broken bigger than it is now, but it broke up about 800 million years ago. And as a result, the Earth and Moon were bombarded. And in a study uh, by uh, the Japanese lunar orbiter Kagua, it showed that of 59 medium-sized craters, eight were formed exactly at the same time as Copernicus, meaning that the impacts all happened at the same time and the earth would have suffered similar uh, 
uh, punishment, and it could have affected primitive life here on Earth. And then if we can go down a bit, if you can, that's it. Right, won't stop, leave Copernicus at the top. That's it. And if you can come down to about two thirds of the way down, just a little bit more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop. There we go. Now I can see some footprints. No, this is this is the area. Just go up a bit. Just up a bit. That down a bit, down a bit, down a bit, down a bit. That dark area. That's it there. That's the Apollo 12 landing site. And it was noticed that uh, uh, that when the Apollo astronauts uh, landed, um, Charles Conrad and Alan Bean were walking along and Bean noticed that Conrad's footprints showed lighter material underneath. So that suggested that something had covered the top surface of the uh, lunar area there. We're about 300 kilometers or well, nearly over 350 kilometers away from Copernicus. And it turned out to be the ejector, the stuff splashed out of the crater during the impact. And they, they took a some sample of this top layer of soil that covered the uh, moon soil underneath, and they were able to date it. And they got a date of 800 million years, which is... Uh, uh, pretty pretty good. So that gives us an age on the the, the, uh, the crater Copernicus. Now, if you come down the uh, Terminator, and this is the boundary between. Here we go. Yeah, uh, we'll go down to the heavily cratered South Pole. Now we can see the craters better, and there's Clavius. We can see. There we go. It's had one or two uh, of its edges knocked about a bit, but as I said, it's a, a surprise, surprisingly good shape considering it's uh, so old. Much of the uh, cratering around there is much, much younger. And we can see there's a series of five craters getting smaller and smaller inside Clavius. One, two, two three, four, five. Yeah. And if we just go a bit to the right, we'll see an even younger crater, which is really prominent in a full moon. This is Tycho. So if you can. Tycho is just, uh, oh, just gone off the screen. It's that one above Clavius. The one with the central peak. That's, that's it. it. Yep. And that's... Uh, that doesn't show very well now, but when it comes full moon and you look at it with, with binoculars, you'll see the ejector that has come out of it. The material has, that has uh, blasted out and you can track it right round the moon. It can covers most of the areas of uh, the front facing surface of the moon. And so that really stands out on a, on a full moon. So in a few days time, that crater will be really prominent in, uh, in, in, in binoculars. And then we come down to the south, south Pole. And there are some craters in the South Pole that are permanently in shadow and uh, there, they've managed to locate water in the uh, in the bottom of these craters. It obviously, it's frozen, but don't think of it as as ice that you can go skating on. It will be slushy, mushy, horrible stuff. But that's having said that, that means that if we do go to the moon, there is a supply of water in some of the craters around the. Um, the moon and there is uh, um, quite a lot of water in the moon but you have to dig down a little way to get to it okay we've just about time to go back to um, Jonathan just to see the thanks David we'll just see 
this comparison of the Pleiades next to the moon. Yeah, so there's the Pleiades shot again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's exactly the same uh, magnification. I'll switch across to the moon, and that was the picture of the moon to the same scale, just to give you an idea of how yeah. big the Pleiades are. Uh, and also, this is this is the sort of picture you get of the moon using my little telescope. Yeah, it's brilliant. And we can certainly see the mare, uh, the, the yeah, seas. You can, you can zoom in a fair bit, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, just, just just one that, that go to the, take your arrow to the Mare Crisium, that one, no, the other one nearer the limb, and just to the left is a white star burst. Uh -huh. Now, that is how Tycho will look. That's just a, a small crater catching yeah. the, the, uh, the light is just right to see the ejector coming out of this... Uh, of this small crater. And that's how Tycho will look on a much grander scale when the moon is full. And actually that, that crater shows that the ejector didn't come out evenly because mm. the, the um, asteroid or large meteorite came in from the left-hand side. So all the ejector has blown out to the right. So it's half past and time for me to shut up. I'll just thank our observers, David, Paul, and uh, Jonathan, and hand you back to Matt. Thank you, Brian. Wonderful. Thank you uh, to everyone, to observers, to uh, Andy Buchan for the wonderful talk, for Brian uh, for presenting the observing so wonderfully as normal. Um, it's been really nice to carry on with a uh, nice, clear evening, and fingers crossed for next week when we're going to be back with a talk all about fast radio bursts from a uh, PhD student, uh, Stefan Hemmersheim. Uh, and that's going to be the same time next week, uh, Wednesday at 7.15pm. Uh, so we will see you then.